Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. This is hey. Seeking Sustainability Live. I'm JJ Walsh in Hiroshima, and today I am talking with uh, Lashan. Lashan Toyota. Yeah. And Lashan, you're in Yokohama, and I know that because your tag is the Yokohama Life, right? <laughs> okay. Actually, that's very misleading. Oh, no. Oh, <laughs> I'm no. disappointing everyone already. Uh, I did live in Yokohama for seven years and when I created the screen name, but I have since moved and I am living in Tokyo, but okay. Yokohama is so much better than Tokyo. So I'm speaking with the name. Well, thanks for joining today. Uh, we're going to be talking about your exciting new project, Find a Doc, which is, mm -hmm. please describe it briefly, and then we'll come back to it a bit later. Okay, sure. Uh, Find a Doc is a small database I started about two weeks ago, and it's aimed at helping primarily non-Japanese speakers to find cancellation waiting lists to get the vaccine here in Japan. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it's amazing. The story is just amazing how quickly it came about. Mm -hmm. um, let's, let's start from the beginning, like your idea came while you were at coding camp is that right yes um so i was in coding boot camp last year uh it started i think uh, at the beginning of november and then i had a solo project that i had to do and i didn't know what to do for my solo project but i knew i wanted to do something for the community so i asked on twitter like does anyone have an idea of what i could do to something I could make to help improve the everyday lives of immigrants living in Japan. And um, one of my mutuals on Twitter, Alex, had a really great suggestion. He was like, how about a site uh, that has uh, that lists services such as doctors or lawyers that speak English? I thought, oh, that's really cool. And it doesn't have to be just English. We could include other languages as well. Um, except I was still new at coding, so my skills really sucked and I couldn't make it at the time. <laughs> but I just like, you know, kept thinking about it like over the course of the rest of the boot camp, And, you know, when I graduated and started working, it was always in the back of my mind, like it was something I wanted to do, um, but I just didn't know when. And yeah, one day I just realized like now was the time um, that something needed to be made, you know, because the vaccine rollout was just going incredibly slow and there was a real lack of information so yeah. i just sat down one evening and cranked it out yeah uh just to mention that we have had yan fang uh from coding chrysalis on the talk show series mm -hmm. uh, she was talking about the need to improve the it situation in japan this is an issue that comes up again and again that was really yeah. great talk and this is where you did your coding boot camp, is that right? Exactly, yeah. She actually reached out to me um, last year. I knew about the boot camp, but I didn't think it was something I could do. Like, I didn't feel like I was smart enough. Like, you have to be smart to be a programmer, right? That was my impression. <laughs> um, but she reached out to me uh, when I was going through a lot with like my personal life and my work during the first state of emergency. And she said, if there's anything I could do to help you out, just let me know. And I was like, at first I was like, oh yeah, sure, thank you. That's really nice. But I was like, hmm, it doesn't hurt to ask, right? So I was like, do you think I could become a programmer? And she was like, yeah, of course, I think you could do it for sure. And she um, introduced me to some free resources at first, just to like see if it was something I was interested in. And I wasn't working full time then uh, due to the pandemic. So she offered me a work study to take their beginners course, the foundations course. And that was like the beginning of my coding journey. That was uh, August of last year. Wow. And um, in the article in the Japan Times that you were in, written by Rochelle Kopp, who has mm -hmm. also been in the series, she's a intercultural, international business expert. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really great article. And she talks about um, that you had left your job during the coronavirus because uh, you were kind of pressured to go and do face-to-face -face teaching. Is that right? 
yes. Uh, I was teaching at a university, um, which is pretty big. Like, depending on the class, you could be in a huge lecture hall. Uh, so it could range anywhere from like 40 to 100 students. And during a pandemic, just the thought of being surrounded by that many people was like absolutely terrifying, especially in the beginning. We, we didn't know much about how the virus was transmitted and just how easily. Um, so I had to make a choice, either teach in person uh, because the university didn't have an online course policy or plan at that time or quit. So I had to quit. <laughs> Uh, because my baby was really young. She was uh, not even 12 months old. I think she was around eight or so, seven or eight months old. And I just didn't want to risk like catching it and bringing that home to her. So, yeah. yeah. And also endangering your life and endangering mm -hmm. the life of your husband as well as your baby. It's yeah. It's great to hear that some organizations, some businesses were very flexible about this from the mm -hmm. beginning, but there were some that really pushed their foot down and said, no, you have to come in and teach face to face, right? Yeah, but also a lot of companies just kind of lagged their feet or dragged their feet. Um, it wasn't until about two weeks after I quit my job that the university said, hey, okay, whoa, whoa. All right, we'll do online courses. Everyone stay. I was like, darn, I already quit. <laughs> Why did you decide this now? Um, but yeah, that's been Japan's response in general to the pandemic, just really slow to, you know, make a decision. Yeah. But yeah. in in the article as well, you were saying you kind of wish you had changed to coding earlier, that it's mm -hmm. been it's been something you've really taken to. Is that right? Yeah, this is true. Um, it's always something I was interested in, always seemed kind of cool, like, even though it's, you know, it's like nerdy, whatever, I think it's cool. Um, but again, I, I always thought you had to be like really good at math and that you had to major in computer science uh, to become a software developer, but that's just not true nowadays. It is possible to learn completely from self-study. Um, I just don't have the discipline to like sit down and do it all on my own. So yeah, once I rolled in the course, I thought, hey, I, I really wish I'd done this a lot sooner. You know, I wish I had done this 10 years ago instead of teaching English for so long. Yeah. Yeah. Now you, in the beginning, you said you weren't sure you could do it. And it sounds mm -hmm. like it was pretty challenging. Uh, tell yes. me, tell me about doing the course. You said 13 hour days or something like it's a lot of coding, mm -hmm. right? Like the beginner's course was nice because I could just go at my own pace. Right. And they had like um, some online sessions you could join to get one on one with the instructors and get some feedback and like work through problems. So I thought, oh, yeah, I'm so good at this. I'm, I'm amazing. I'm like the best programmer ever. And then like I took the interview for the boot camp and I bombed it the first time. I cried like a baby. <laughs> Went back to studying. <laughs> it's okay. It happens. Um I passed it the second time. And when I joined the boot camp, like they warned us. They even gave us letters to share with our friends and family to say, hey, over the next 12 weeks or whatever. I'm going to be really busy, possibly stressed out and not really available in the way you're used to me being. Uh, please be patient with me and support me as you as best as you can. And I just thought, oh, it can't be that bad. But I gave it to my friends and family anyway. And oh my God, it was like ridiculously tough. <laughs> yeah. Um, even for people who had more experience, there's this so much work you have to get through each day and anything you don't have you don't finish you have to finish and submit by 9 a.m the next morning um so that was really hard like even though i wasn't working my daughter was in daycare while she was in daycare i took the class and then when she was home i took care of her you know fed her played with her put her in a bath and then whenever i got her to sleep like around nine o'clock or so that's when I could finally like get to my homework and I would be up until like one or 2 a.m. sometimes just trying to get everything completed like wow. by the deadline. Yeah. 
and then you were at work early the next morning and up with your daughter and doing the routine as well, right? Well, I was up at the back in the boot camp the next morning. It was every day from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, and we only had like a few days off, like in December. We were lucky because most of the cohorts don't have any time off. I don't know how they do it. <laughs> Wow. But we had like a little break, like around Christmas. Well, yeah. good for you being able to complete it and juggling being a full-time mother as well. Mm -hmm. That's that's pretty awesome. Um, Thank you. Were, you. were you able to find someone to take care of your daughter while you're studying a little bit? Um, like my husband was also working from home and he had a lot of meetings in the evening as well. So if he didn't have a meeting, he would watch her. Um, otherwise I would have to take care of her. So we just had to kind of juggle and share the responsibility. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's great. It's great to have a, an understanding and supportive partner that definitely helps. Uh, <laughs> we have Mo here from New York city and she says she is a former it business owner here listening in. Thanks Hi, Mo. for joining. Hey, Kim, Kim and Sinbad has joined rushed home from work to catch this. Hey, thanks for joining. Um, so how did you decide, uh, okay, I'm going to just try to make a database. Um, mm -hmm. you, you said in the article that you noticed on Twitter, mm -hmm. um, the comments and everything, everybody seemed depressed. It was dark and that kind of spurred you to try to do something. So yeah. how, how did that start? Where did that come from? Well, there were rumors starting to float around where people uh, had successfully gotten the vaccine, um, but information was getting lost between tweets, you know? Um, so I knew of two places where people had signed up for cancellation waiting lists just based on, you know, what I had heard, word of mouth on Twitter. So I thought if two places exist, there have to be more. So we just needed a place where we could list them all and keep it up to date. And that kind of resource didn't exist. And it's impossible for one person to go out and find all of that. So I thought, you know, a community database would be really good where people could submit the clinics as they found them and also report them as the information became outdated. It seemed like that would be like the quickest and most efficient way to get information out to people. So yeah, that's why I went with a database. And this is not long ago. Didn't you just launch it? Is it the 13th you announced yeah. it on Twitter? Yeah, I started it that Sunday. I think it was the 13th around 5 p.m. Um, and I think around 10 or 11, I posted on Twitter like, hey, it's, it's not pretty, but here's a database, it works. You know, Please you know, share it and let's post more clinics and whatnot. And it really just took off like unbelievably fast. Yeah, let's talk about numbers a little bit. Yeah, uh, it's uh, you said in the article from the second day you mm -hmm. had three hundred thousand requests. Yeah, within the first twenty-four hours, there were over three hundred thousand re-requests to the database, which completely destroyed the free quota that I was using uh, through Google. So the site actually went down for a few minutes while it, like scrambled to like you know get a paid service and then you know people were just like so like excited and also like so desperate to like get this information like they were offering to donate to help keep the database running um, because it was getting slammed with so much traffic so yeah big thank you to everyone who helped keep the site up yeah that's amazing so from the very beginning did mm -hmm. you buy the domain? Did you have this URL from the very beginning? Um, no, I actually bought it that night. Um, at first I tried like a US host and it was findadocjp.org. But I just thought that that's a little bit too long. I wanted to make it as short as possible and as easy for people to remember, especially if they're just talking about it at work or something. Um, so like a couple hours later, I managed to get the domain findadoc.jp and switched over to that. So as some posts online, like the old tweets, you might see the old domain address, but it still works. And you've been working on it, um, improving the design. Um, mm -hmm. You've had collaborators. Now yep. you have 
uh, 50 clinics listed and it's in 17 languages. Is that right? We, I think we actually have over 60 clinics now, like uh, somewhere around 64 or so. And we had another language added last night. Uh, someone added Catalan, which is amazing. So we got that um, up and running right away. So I think we're at, yeah, at 18 languages. The, wow. Like the localization community has been amazing. Like just people who have volunteered to like, you know, hop and get and submit, you know, translations for their native languages, like so quickly too. They've just been wonderful. Yeah, Kim is mentioning about so many clinics in Kyoto. And mm -hmm. Kyoto is the screenshot I'm showing now because I was impressed by how many they had. So yeah. some very active users in Kyoto. That's awesome to see. Mm -hmm. um, so what is the reason to make it open source for people who don't understand what that is? Can you run it, walk us through that a little bit? Yes. Um... Because the project is open source, um, anyone can go to GitHub and contribute to the repository. Also, like if anyone wants to do like a similar project, they can just take the source code and make something else. Um, I just thought that because all of this is a community effort, it's all built, you know, based on what volunteers are doing, that it should be open source. Right, it should be freely available to everyone. So, um, yeah, it's been really great. Uh, but having it open source has really like <laughs> made my life kind of hectic, just because so many people want to help and contribute. Um, I've had to switch from coding to managing more, and it's not something I'm really used to when it comes to, uh, you know, software projects like this. It's new yeah, for me. Definitely. Uh, yeah. Let's talk about your team a little bit. I know that Ann Kiltzer has been a big, mm -hmm. big help. Um, but in the article, you say you really like how people have offered help, people have supported, but yes. not taken over. And that's, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah, right off the bat, um, Ann was the first person I asked to help me uh, before I made the repo public, just because I wanted to make sure the data that we had collected so far was like very safe and secure. And Anne is like such an experienced developer. Um, when I was job hunting, uh, she helped me out, like with coaching me like through some uh, programming sessions. So I knew her style was like just very friendly. And um, the way that she teaches is like very easy to follow. She never made me feel like dumb for not knowing something or for asking questions. So I really wanted her to be part of the project and she was like open for it. She's like, yes, I wanna do it. Let's let's jump on it. And um, yeah, she just started helping me out right away. And it's been like great working with her. That's awesome. I'm showing on screen all the, the people that are helping. And yeah. I was I was really interested to, to hear that not only everybody's supporting, and it wasn't just about the coding that they were helping with. They were also helping manage and organize mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. kind of program. Is that right? That's true. Yeah. Because we're getting like just so many submissions to the project. Um, there's a lot that goes into the background, like making sure we have um, all of the testing in place when someone submits code, making sure um, that there aren't any security vulnerabilities. So approving like which code gets deployed and which doesn't uh, is more than I could do. Like at the same time, I'm still in the background checking all of the submissions, going to each individual site and making sure they're le legitimate sites. So I really need, needed some help with just like managing the code base like in general. Yeah. So Anne has been helping with that um, as well as Philip from Indeed and uh, Derek from Amazon, they've been just a huge help. Wow, that's awesome. You mentioned in the article, Japan Times, uh, mm -hmm. you had help from people working at Google, Amazon, Indeed, Mercury. That's amazing. So they're all volunteering in their free time too. They're right? all volunteering like after they've worked, you know, these long days at these really like huge companies, like they come online and 
help out with this tiny project. And it's just been really awesome. I've been learning so much from them. And all of them have just been like, just helpful. And they've taken like a really good mentorship approach. And they, like I said, they haven't taken over the project. So when I still need to get something out fast, even if the code isn't pretty, I just push it. And then they teach me later how to do it correctly. <laughs> So yeah, it's been nice. Awesome. I love that um, in the article, you also said that this has taught you so much by trying to get an actual product out and working mm -hmm. is, yeah. is the best kind of study. Is that right? It's the best kind of crash course. Um, finding all of these bugs and issues once users are actually using your application and using it in ways you hadn't expected or requesting features that you hadn't thought of before. Um, yeah, just having that level of interaction has been really good. A lot of our features were added just because people have requested them on Twitter, like the report feature, also like showing, you know, tags for if a voucher is needed or not, or if residency is needed or not. Like those are directly because people asked for them. That's awesome. I, I yeah. love the design. It's very easy to use. I have mm -hmm. signed up for a vaccination clinic in my area of Hiroshima. So I was, okay. so, I was so happy to see that there's a few listed for Hiroshima. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, really easy to understand. Do you need a voucher or not? So yeah. some places are allowing you to get a, a canceled vaccine, is it? And then you'd mm -hmm. be on the waiting list. So you don't need your voucher yet? Is that how yeah. it works? It differs from clinic to clinic and also day to day. Um, some clinics will allow you to make a reservation without a voucher and without being a resident. Um, some will only let you join the cancellation list. Um, so we try to put in a note, uh, which is the case for that particular clinic as well as a date, uh, because as we discovered in the past week, um, the local governments are really cracking down hard on clinics um, regarding who they can or cannot uh, administer the vaccine to. So yeah, the information changes very quickly. Um, but again, <laughs> we have to rely on users to report it. Otherwise we have no way of knowing. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was so sad to hear that news. Uh, mm -hmm. This is about a month ago or so that a lot of the vaccines are being thrown away if people mm -hmm. miss their appointments. That was just gut wrenching because there's yeah. so many people waiting, right? Yeah, there are so many people waiting. Um, and the voucher system has just really slowed everything down. So, so many people that want to get the vaccine and despite finding reservations that are open, they just can't sign up for them because they don't have a voucher and it just makes no sense. Like, um, I don't want to say specifically the clinic's name, but uh, the clinic I got my first shot from um, didn't require a voucher at the time and they really got hammered by the local government. So now they have to require a voucher and people didn't find out until the day of their appointment, they showed up and the clinic had to turn them away. And so those shots were just sitting there, right? Um, luckily, a couple of people were able to stay until after closing time and get it so they wouldn't go to waste. Uh, but had those people not been there, they would have thrown away like a bunch of shots. And just think of how many other clinics are going through the same thing right now. Yeah. No, I, it just doesn't seem to make any sense to get rid of use, useful, not like expired or anything. Mm -hmm. What is the rationale for throwing them away? Do you know? Japan doesn't like to do anything outside of the rules. So since the rule has been set that you need a voucher, even if it makes logical sense to like give them, like to just get the vaccine in an arm so it doesn't go to waste, um, there's just this pressure to not break the rules. Um, but luckily, some clinics, some doctors are just, you know, following their professional judgment and doing it anyway when it's necessary. Well, that's that's part of their credo, right? To do yeah. no harm and to take care of people. So I'm I'm glad that's happening. And it's so frustrating, all this red tape. 
Um, mm -hmm. It's wonderful that you you have a, a way for clinics who are offering waiting lists and are offering voucher or not and make it so clear. And in 17 languages. I can't yeah. believe it. <laughs> I can't I either. We opened it up to languages and just within the span of a couple hours, we had so many submissions. Like people are wonderful. They really are. Yeah. I I had heard um, that the reason they were throwing them away is because that's what they usually do for mm -hmm. other kinds of vaccines. So mm -hmm. if it's a flu vaccine and somebody mm -hmm. reserves it and then they don't come, that's yeah. what they've always done. There's there's no logic to it in my mind, but mm -hmm. that's the formality, that's the system. So hopefully that can be changed because we're bound to have more pandemics in the future too, right? Well, not only that, but now Japan is struggling with a supply issue. Like people can't make their appointments for the second shots because there just aren't enough vaccines in the country to get them. So it doesn't make sense to keep throwing them away. And it also doesn't make sense for random people to keep unplugging the refrigerators. Um, like these are lives that are, are at stake. And yeah, I feel like it could be managed and safeguarded much better than it is. Yeah. I, yeah. I know as an American, that's one of the frustrations for me in Japan is the lack of flexibility, right? Mm -hmm. And in, in America, we saw, wasn't it, vac vaccine doctors were stuck in traffic and they got out and they vaccinated people who were stuck in traffic just yeah. randomly. <laughs> like <laughs> That would never happen in Japan. America handled the pandemic terribly, but it handed, they handled the vaccine rollout like fantastically. Like they took over stadiums and said, these are vaccine venues now. Like. Like the government just said, okay, do whatever is necessary, vaccinate people in parking lots, vaccinate them at the drugstore, wherever you can do it, just do it, just get the vaccines out. And yeah, it, I thought that was like a really good approach that Japan had a lot of time to learn from, but didn't. So yeah, there's that. Well, that, that said, with your website, thank you so much, is really helpful. A lot of people are getting vaccinated who are on the waiting list. There's also more vaccines at universities, mm -hmm. at businesses right now. Um, yeah. I, I know the, the numbers, I think Melanie Brock posted that the numbers of people 50 and up has gone up 50% or something. Like it's the mm -hmm. rates of vaccination is really quickly improved yeah. in Japan. Yeah, the rate is really high um, and it's where it should be but six months ago. <laughs> so I'm glad we're finally there. Like that's the positive. We're finally there. Um, a lot of people are able to get their first shots, especially if they're 65 and older. Yeah, it's something like over 50% at least have gotten their first shot. Um, but it's a little bit scary because we're at the point where now where most people won't be fully vaccinated by the time the Olympics begin. Like it's just not possible because you have to wait three weeks or so between the shots and yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, we, yeah, go ahead. We have a comment from Lonely Bob here. The vaccines mm -hmm. are stored frozen and are defrosted for use on the day. After defrosting, they cannot be refrozen. That is why they must be used on the same day or thrown away. So this yeah. is more power to your idea of getting people on waiting lists. And if they mm -hmm. people don't show up, they get called and they can get there and get a vaccine before it's thrown away, right? Exactly, That's yeah. Perfect. The goal is to have zero waste, yeah. Wonderful, so, so important for sustainability, mm -hmm. not only for getting rid of the waste, but also for making our community healthier. That's, that's sustainability too. Yeah, um, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, now, one important thing in Japan. So you have your website is in 17 languages. This is mm -hmm. amazing. But of mm -hmm. course, in Japan, once they get to the next step of the website of the clinic, yes. it's very unlikely it's going to be in English or their language, right? Exactly. And I yeah. see you've been helping people um, kind of on a case by case on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um that's a step-by-step -step thing it's so hard right can people use hard. google translate maybe to help with that they can 
Uh, Google Translate is better with some languages than others. Uh, so it just depends. Also, like some of the websites are built much better than others. Like a lot of these Japanese websites though, feel like they haven't been updated since like the 90s or something. So it's really hard to navigate them with or without a translator. So like for that clinic in particular, I had to take actual screenshots because they had two different booking calendars and people couldn't find, you know, how to book a slot for the vaccine. Oh yeah. My gosh. So there's just confusion all over the place. Um, I also provided links for the pre-vaccination uh, screening documents, the survey, um, which has to be completed in Japanese, but they do have it translated and available in other languages. Um, so I linked to those as a reference as well. I saw you you took a picture of the form that you had to fill in before you mm -hmm. got your shot. Yeah. And it's it's not easy. It's it's pretty difficult. Um, mm -hmm. Have you heard of anybody using like the Google Image Translate to help? Um, I don't know if anyone has used that. Uh, the particular clinic I went to had it uh, like references printed out in other languages that they could hand to you like here look at this but fill it out in Japanese um, and it also can be downloaded beforehand so I think that's like the safest bet so that way you at least know it's accurate uh, just go to the Ministry of Health site and get it you know get the download for your native language that's really good yeah, yeah. that's that's very useful um, you've you've also since you have an open source um, mm -hmm. database here, you have had some false information yes. being added. Can you talk about that a little bit? Unfortunately, uh, it happens every day, multiple times a day. Uh, so I have to be really careful. I let one slip by, and I realized it later after someone flagged it. Um, the issue is uh, well. First, they're just bots that submit false data. So I have to just go through and clean that up. But also there are fake websites that have been created uh, within the past month or so um, that are trying to get people's personal information, like their name, their address, phone number, and even their voucher numbers and their birth dates. Um, so you really have to be careful about who you submit your data to. Um, although the clinic might be real, although the clinic might be legitimate, the website that gets submitted might not be. Um, it could be just something fake that someone set up like a week ago to look like the real one. Uh, so we have to like do all this research to see like when the domain was registered, who it was registered by, does it match the domain of the business listed on Google Maps and whatnot. Do they have reviews and like what's the history of the reviews? Has the clinic been around for a while? So yeah, there's a lot of pressure and a lot of responsibility to make sure that you know fraudulent information doesn't make its way onto the database. Yeah. And that's I you have a disclaimer on the the website. Yeah. Um, saying this is open source. Please check your information carefully. Mm -hmm. um, please, you know, we try to take it off anything that we know is fraudulent or we think is dodgy, um, yeah. but we can't control everything, you know, and, yes. and hopefully people who use it can realize that. Have you had any haters, like any people giving you guys a hard time? Uh, it's the internet. There's always haters, <laughs> no matter like what you do. Yeah. But I just don't pay them any mind. Uh, it's usually just people trying to get fake submissions onto the database, no like personal attacks or anything so far, luckily. Yeah. So I just, you know, find them, delete them, move on. Ah, oh, good. Uh, yeah. Lonely Bob has some good advice. Downloaded the documents in your own language and the Japanese version. Mm -hmm. Fill in the language form from your language, then fill in the same fields in the Japanese pre-screening questionnaire yeah bring really both helps. forms on the day of your appointment <laughs> and uh <laughs> temperature on the pre-screening questions should be filled in at the vaccination site there's very good tips thank you Bob. Yeah, it's awesome yeah I, it's it's just good to have as much information as you can mm -hmm. have all the documentation that you can 
very important. Now, when yeah. you got vaccinated, because this is all free, mm -hmm. um, do they check ID? Like, is it connected to your identity at all? Again, this will vary between every clinic. In my situation, um, because of some of the pressure they were starting to come under, it was a don't ask, don't tell situation. So I filled out my pre-screening form. I submitted that. I wasn't a resident and I didn't have my voucher and they let me get my vaccine and I just had to hand over my health insurance card. So there weren't any questions asked. Now, however, with that very same clinic, that's not the situation. Um, they do check the first moment you arrive if you have a voucher and then they check, you know, if you have your health insurance card. They are still allowing some people, depending on when they made the reservation, to get the vaccine, even if they're not a resident. But um, anyone who makes uh, a reservation from now, I think, well, as of last Wednesday, they do have to be a resident of that ward. So yeah, it's changing and fluctuating so much. Right, yeah, it's yeah. hard to keep up with the information. But mm -hmm. if you do have an update or if people are adding information, they can write that in a note next to the link. Is that right? They can write in a note. Um, a lot of people just tweet it out and they notice it. And I try to verify it with them, ask them if they can write the note and I can just approve it. Um, yeah. But a lot of it's just word of mouth. But if anyone has a different experience than what's listed on the database, please, please um, flag that particular entry so I can get it updated right away. I do update it like several times throughout the day. How do you have time? This is an amazing amount of time crunch that you're doing on top of you have a full time job and a toddler at home, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just don't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I last night was the earliest I went to sleep in a while, um, but it's okay. I'm used to running on very little sleep because this is important. Um, eventually, it will get to the point where everyone who wants the vaccine will have it and things will slow down and we won't need, you know, to get information out as quickly. And then I can like relax. But yeah, I think it's it's just important to stay as up to date as much as possible right now so we can help as many people as possible. Well, this is a perfect time to mention your Kofi account that if yeah. people would like to donate to all this amazing <laughs> amount of extra time that you're spending on it, um, you mm -hmm. can find the Kofi account on the uh, Find a Doc Japan. Wait, I want to get the address right here. Yeah. Find a doc um, JP. Findadoc.jp. Yeah, we have a little donate button at the bottom, and that's to buy me caffeine and pizza just to keep me going. <laughs> okay, you need it, and we want to support you. So, yeah. definitely. And then you also have the coffee link from your Twitter, I believe. Is that right? I think so. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's pinned to my Twitter timeline if you look at my profile. And Twitter is the Yokohama Life. Is that right? Yeah, the Yokohama Life. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, just to get back to how the vaccine works a little bit more mm -hmm. um, for people who haven't gotten the vaccine yet. Uh, okay. So when you went in, you showed your uh, health insurance card mm -hmm. and you filled out the form there. Mm -hmm. That's right. And then you got the, you had already been in touch and signed up as like a standby beforehand and you got an email. Um, is that right? So with this clinic, um, it wasn't for the waiting list. They actually had reservations completely open. So you could reserve an actual slot that was guaranteed and you could go in and get the vaccine. Um, but as of now, reservations are still open. Um, I don't think they have a waiting list, but a lot of clinics do. Um, it's best to have your documents printed and filled out beforehand. I didn't know about them. I didn't find out till later. Uh, when I posted that picture, um, some people shared the link with me and I was like, oh, okay. That would have been really nice to have because I really struggle <laughs> with like filling some of it out. Um, some of the medical related kanji stumped me. Um, but yeah, 
generally you need to have like your ID card, your health insurance card, your voucher, and that form completed to get the vaccine. Awesome. And uh, I saw on Rochelle's uh, Twitter as well that she was able to get the shot. And mm -hmm. I've seen on Twitter so many people saying, yeah. I was able to get the shot. Thank you so it's much. Amazing. Find doc. Thank you so much, LaShawn. So that, that must feel great to have that feedback and know it's working, right? Yeah. And thank you to Scotty. Uh, Scotty originally shared the clinic with me that so many people have successfully gotten their vaccine from. Um, but the reach has just been amazing and unexpected. Um, at this point, like hundreds of people have been vaccinated for sure at just one clinic. So if there's there's no way to know, but I suspect like we've had we've gotten more than a thousand people vaccinated overall, like across Japan, but we'll never actually know. Um, the real numbers, but that's okay. The fact that we've helped people is good enough reason to work on it. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. You're you're helping so much people, so many people, and you're also giving people a lot of hope at a time mm -hmm. when everybody is so frustrated with the situation, right? Yeah. Yeah. I was really frustrated too. Um, but just like hearing the rumors that it was a possibility that we could get vaccinated soon gave me hope. And that was enough to like motivate me to like jump on this project. So I'm glad I could give others hope as well. That's awesome. Now you, most of the vaccines available or all of the vaccines available in Japan, mm -hmm. um, you need two shots, right? You need two shots for so, all of the vaccines currently. Yeah. So are, you, are you given a card and then you show that showing that you've had the first vaccine? How does yeah. that work? So if you have your voucher, when you get the first vaccine, uh, they give you like some kind of sticker that has like your confirmation on it and it shows like you got it and when you got it. Um, but because I didn't have my voucher, I have nothing to show for it other than a sore arm. <laughs> um, but some clinics, what they're allowing you to do in that situation is you get the first shot and then you could come back with your voucher later to get your confirmation. So then you can get your second shot there or at another clinic. Oh, wow. So it's a bit more difficult than it seems it should be. Um, the whole we, voucher system is an absolute mess. <laughs> so even if you had like a receipt or something after your visit that you can yeah. show the next time, um, that would be better, right? I think so too. Um, but they can't even give you that. They can't give you anything without a voucher. Wow. So, so there's just, no receipt. I have no slip even showing my next appointment, even though it's booked. I have absolutely nothing. So wow. it's a little worrying, especially with, you know, the supply, you know, being, you know, insufficient right now. I don't know if my second shot is guaranteed or not. Wow. But you have booked a second shot at the same place? Yeah, at the time they were allowing us to book our second shot before leaving the clinic. Um, but as of last week, that's no longer the case because they can't guarantee the shots anymore. Wow. Because it must be on record with your insurance number somewhere. They should give you something that shows yeah. that you've had it, right? Yeah, they did uh, take my insurance card. So that is on file. Um, but I do need the voucher to get the second shot and to get the vaccine passport that is coming out at the end of July. So if you don't have the voucher with the two confirmation stickers, you can't get the vaccine passport. Wow. Uh, we have a question here from JJ. I need to get a COVID-19 test done for my mm -hmm. travel to America. So you don't know anything about testing, do you? Most of the clinics that are doing the vaccine also do the PCR tests. Um, and I think a lot of them are under the 40,000 yen mark. So yeah, I, I think the, the appointment system is also different, like separate from the vaccine. So even if all of their vaccination slots are full, you could probably make just a regular appointment to get the PCR test done. Yeah, I saw in Osaka, 
um, they had like a P a PCR test walk-in clinic and you yeah. pay the machine, you do the test, you get the result, come back in an hour for the result or something. So very efficient systems are mm -hmm. being set up. Maybe now that people are starting to travel more or their work is requiring it. I'm not sure why, but there, the demand for PCR tests has certainly gone up. I think the demand for PCR tests was always high, but people were just not eligible to receive them. Like for months, almost, well, maybe a whole year, um, the Japanese government wouldn't allow the hospitals and clinics to give the PCR tests unless there was a clear um, like trace of like close contact with someone who had COVID and who had been to China, even though it was shown that it was coming in from all these other countries as well. Um, so yeah, I think the demand was always high, but people just couldn't get them. Crazy. I, I heard so many stories from people who mm -hmm. had all the symptoms. They would go in, they would get tested for every single thing, but Else, COVID. But that. Yeah. So they would get like a, a x-ray for their lungs. They would get, you know, some got an MRI, like serious testing all around the issue. And mm. even when all everything else was negative, they were still declined the test. So and I, think, I am, mm -hmm. I'm glad it's improved a little bit since then. Yeah, a lot of that had to do with um, the Japanese law, I believe. Someone correct me if I'm wrong out there. Um, but if someone tested positive for COVID, um, they, the hospital was required to give them a hospital bed and there just wouldn't have been enough hospital beds for everyone, especially for people with mild cases. So unless someone was like, you know, seriously um, ill from it, they tested everything else, said, well, it's not these and you seem like you're okay for now go back home <laughs> because they just didn't have the hospital beds. Uh, well, I, I hope we're learning a lot of great lessons during this pandemic and mm -hmm. applying them to make improvements for next future pandemics. Um, Kim says the university that did mine allowed people to get their shots without the voucher and they give you a document for proof. Then you mm -hmm. have to bring the voucher when you get it, but the document is all you need for the second shot. So okay. it sounds like some some places are doing it in a really efficient way. That's great. Yeah. Awesome, awesome. And Mo says she's going to share your initiative with Governor Cuomo in New York. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great your your idea. Your open source database could expand across the world to other countries that yeah. have similar problems. Have well, you heard? Um, because it's open source, anyone's free to download it and get it going in their countries. Um, yeah, feel free, get it up and running, help as many people as you can. Yeah, that would be awesome. And if you do, just send me a tweet so I can know about it and I'll retweet it. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so any other issues that have come up or anything else that you'd like to say about um, this database, find a doc? Uh, yeah, just um, please like keep in mind, like I said, it is community submitted content and I am keeping it, keeping it as up to date as much as possible, as possible, but it will never be 100% accurate. Uh, because things are changing so quickly. So please just be patient, um, not just with me, but be patient with the clinics. If when you get there, you find that, you know, the information on the database doesn't match the actual policy that's happening at the clinic, you know, when you arrive. Uh, please don't yell at the clinic staff. They're under a lot of stress. They're under a lot of pressure. So be kind to them. Take them a thank you card or if they'll accept it, like some store package suites or something, you know, everyone's trying their hardest to get through this pandemic. So let's just help each other and be kind to each other. That is such great advice and so important to say. I know that Rochelle, when she did her shot, uh, she said she gave the doctor some cookies and she mm -hmm. said, thank you so much. And I think just saying thank you and just being kind to the medical staff, because 
they are not the ones making these archaic rules and making it difficult, right? Exactly. They're, yeah. They're in a really difficult situation. So showing kindness for people on the front lines and mm -hmm. at the most risk for this whole pandemic time yeah. definitely is something we want to do. They're working so hard. Like I got mine done at a children's clinic and they're still staying open until 9 p.m. giving shots. And after 9 p.m., like just cleaning up and closing the clinic and then they have to be back by 8 a.m. the next morning. And they're doing that every day. So, yeah, please just keep that in mind. They're doing the best they can. And let's show them, you know, we're grateful for that. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you so much for those words. It's so important to keep in mind. Um, be, we have about 10 minutes left. Before we finish, I would love to give a shout out to your beautiful blog, the Yokohama Life blog. <laughs> uh -huh. um, and it has a lot of great resources for people pregnant in Japan, uh, working in Japan, thinking about lots of the issues like finding an apartment. Um, mm -hmm. So I would send people over there to have a look. You, like you said, it's difficult to update, um, but there's some great information there. And how did you find having a baby in Japan? Any issues? Yeah, um, it's hard to say because, you know, she's my first and only baby. So I, I don't really have anything to compare it to. Um, but I think overall, my experience was pretty good. Uh, Japan has a lot of the healthcare system in Japan is very good for expecting mothers. Um, I had regular visits and checkups at the hospitals. They didn't really cost me much except for like the blood work. Uh, but they have like a system where you get a lot of that refunded back to you. Um, so like compared to this is just what I've heard, but compared to some mothers in the States, I was able to get ultrasounds much more frequently and see my baby much more often here in Japan than I would have had I been there. And also like just having like four days at the hospital after having my baby was amazing. It was wonderful. And nurses were great. Um, just having that support because, you know, like being in another country meant I didn't have my family here to help me and, you know, to get me through those first couple of days and, you know, to teach me certain things. So it was nice being able to have an extended stay at the hospital that doesn't break the bank. Yeah. So I think Japan is really good for that. Um, also just uh, the childcare after having, you know, your baby, um, you have free healthcare all the way up until high school for your child, which I think is like fantastic. And that alone is like one of the reasons I think I'll probably be here for life. So. <laughs> Yeah, um, I think overall Japan is is a really wonderful country. The healthcare system is really great. I don't think any of the issues we've had with the vaccine rollout is due to the healthcare system itself. It's really wonderful. Um, yeah, I couldn't say any more like great things about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I w I was telling you before we went live that it's been a long time since mm -hmm. I had my kids here. Um, but people still say they read my articles and find them useful. So I'm sure there's some tidbits there that someone who is expecting or just had a kid or thinking about having a kid in Japan would really yeah. find useful. So I would recommend. And you also have a great YouTube channel, also kind of on the, the parenting and having a baby in Japan theme, right? Yeah, I wouldn't say it's great. It only has like about five videos or something. <laughs> My, yeah, my blog and my YouTube channel were both focused around parenting and motherhood in Japan, but they kind of got a little neglected once the pandemic started and I started focusing on coding. Um, but now, uh, once things have, you know, calmed down with Find a Doc, I think I'll have time to go back and revisit them and freshen them up a bit. But yeah. Check out the Yokohama Life on YouTube or the yokohamalife.com if you want to read my blog post about being a mommy in Japan. Yeah, that's awesome. And just going back to find a doc, what are your future plans? I've heard um, mm -hmm. in the article you were saying you'd love to continue it even after 
um, the vaccines are not an issue and use it in some way as a medical resource. Is that right? Yeah, I like to go back to that original suggestion that Alex made just to have like a, a service that people can go to to find, you know, healthcare professionals that speak their native language. Um, but I also thought about adding other filters, like uh, if the building is um, accessible for people with disabilities, um, or if the clinic or hospital is like LGBTQ friendly, I think that would be really helpful as well. So yeah, uh, moving on into the future, that is something we'll work on. It's just the cancellation waiting list is the priori priority right now because it's what people need right now. Um, but slowly in the background, we are working on implementing these new features. Yeah, awesome. Well, I've, I've been so impressed and I hope everybody remembers that this is just started. This is brand new. It's two and weeks it's, old. <laughs> oh my gosh. And it's yeah. already got hundreds of thousands of users yeah. and hundreds of people who have been successful getting mm -hmm. their shot from this resource. So thank you so much for doing all of this work. I know it's not easy and we really appreciate you. You guys really get to that Kofi site and donate, buy her some coffees, <laughs> buy her some pizza. More pizza. <laughs> <laughs> thank you everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Kim. Both of you are awesome for what you do. Thanks you so much. JJ and LaShawn, this is such an informative and wonderful broadcast. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for uh, coming, everyone. Yeah. Mo in New York, she's going to take it to New York. And she says, this is going to go big. Wouldn't that be exciting to see it go internationally? Yeah, let me know, Mo. Like, please send me a tweet and just let me know, like, what people think of it abroad, like in the U.S. or wherever else. I'm interested. Yeah, because... I know a lot of people, even in Japan, were thinking about going home and mm -hmm. getting a vaccination at home. But mm -hmm. when I just looked into it, what happens if I go to Hawaii? Would I be able to get a vaccine? There's nothing very clear, like no one site. You have to go to lots of different uh, hospital websites or lots of different information. So it would be great to have this abroad as well. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Hopefully some people will be willing to pick it up so we can expand. Mo says, I will. So let's see. I'm excited. Excited to see how it happens. Yeah. Um, now, you said you met some people who were randomly talking about Find a Doc. And <laughs> yeah. they didn't know that you created it. Is that right? Over the weekend, um, I met with one of my friends. She recently had a baby. Well, her baby's four months old now. So we met for the first time so I could meet her little one. And her coworkers were there. Um, and they were like, hey, LaShawn, what have you been up to? I was like, oh, I've been, you know, working. And I have this database I've been working on in my free time. And someone was like, oh, you're working on a database. Oh, do you know about like Find a Doc? It's like this place where you can find vaccines and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, uh, actually, I made it, and they were like, they didn't believe me at first, like, what? Oh, like, yeah, yeah, if you check the about page, that you'll see my awesome. picture. They're like, oh my god, you're a celebrity, and I'm like, no, no, I'm just this dork who like sits behind her computer all day, but, but it was cool. <laughs> no, I mean, you have been in the Japan Times now, it only came out yesterday, uh, you you are getting accolades, you know, people are really appreciative and hopefully that'll continue. You deserve it all. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everybody, for joining today. And tomorrow, uh, I'm not sure what time. It hasn't been confirmed yet, but I will at some point be talking to Alana Bonzi about cleanups that she does in Fujisawa. So I will post that here and definitely join us again tomorrow. And then on Thursday, it's July already. Can you believe it? Time Thursday, flies. Thursday, I'm talking with Zoe in Kochi, and she's talking about uh, sustainability and travel. So that'll be a really good one. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for joining. Thank you so much, LaShawn. Keep up Thank the you. good work, and we really appreciate you. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Take care.